Good afternoon, everyone. Our next speaker is Tim Head, and the title of his talk is Look Mom, No Hands from Blinking LEDs to a Bike Speedometer with MicroPython. So please give a warm welcome to Tim Head. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tim, and hopefully we will, uh, at the end of this 30 minutes, you will understand why there's a bike at the front here. Um, hopefully also, because this involves lots of live demos, nothing will go wrong. Um, if it does, then please help me as much as you can. Um, so I will talk about uh, how you can use MicroPython and a microcontroller to build a speedometer for your bike. And because this reminds me of my youth, then I titled the talk, Look Mum, No Hands. But I promise I will not cycle without any hands. So how did I get started with this? About a year ago, I listened to a talk about MicroPython in the local um, Python meetup, and I was so impressed and thought, wow, I need to, I need to try this out myself. And so I went out and ordered some components. And the first thing I did, I think one, really one of the first projects I did was uh, this. And I think more people should do this themselves. And just to give you an idea, I know nothing about electronics. I know nothing about microcontrollers. I spend my days um, writing uh, machine learning software. So I'm really a, a software guy. So, yeah, as I said, what we will do today is build one of these guys, slightly more MVP. Uh, this is what you can find on uh, AliExpress. And I had one of these, when I was a kid, this was one of the coolest gadgets you could have for your bike. And its main purpose was to tell you how fast you had gone down the local big hill, and you could compare it to your friends. And then they would probably check, you know, do you have any scratches on your elbows also? Did you cheat by falling off? Um, and the way it works, it has a little display, and it has on the right-hand side a little sensor that you attach uh, to your fork and to your wheel, and then every time the wheel goes round, uh, you count that it's gone round once, and from that you can calculate the speed. So, microcontrollers. They are everywhere around us. So I think in your telephone, in your car, in your remote control, uh, literally everywhere there will be a microcontroller these days. And they are more or less full-featured computers. So they have a CPU, they have RAM. Um, however, they usually have very little processing power and very little amount of memory. So that's good because they use very little power, so you can drive one of these off a coin cell battery, so you don't need to bring a USB power device. And this also means that usually you program these in something like assembler or C, and that has all the advantages and disadvantages of programming stuff in C. So you, know, you write your program on your laptop, you compile it, it tells you you made typos, you fix the typos, you compile it again, you copy it onto uh, your microcontroller, and you try and run it, and it gets stuck somewhere, and you essentially have no idea how and where it got stuck, and you try and figure out some way to do the debugging, um, but it's quite tedious. And I think for, for the hobbyists, the Arduino 15 years ago or something like this really started uh, microcontrollers for normal people, because it's fairly cheap, it's fairly accessible, um, the downside is I think it has a 16 megahertz clock and an amount of memory measured in kilobytes. So you cannot get Python to run on this. No matter, I think there are some people who did try and they succeeded to some extent, but for normal people, it's essentially impossible to get Python running on one of these guys. So then a few years ago, um, mi microcontrollers had gotten a lot more powerful and a lot more memory, still not a lot, but a lot more. So this is a ESP8266, and it's extremely po um, popular. And I think the, the number one reason for why it's so popular is it has Wi-Fi built in. So the little squiggly area, uh, little squiggly thing 
that you can see is the, the aerial for the Wi-Fi. And it has a massive CPU that runs at 80 megahertz, and it has a few megabytes of memory. But this is enough to run a stripped down version of Python. So I think two years ago, roughly, Damien George got bored of doing string theory and uh, thought, well, let's find out how hard it can be to put Python on microcontrollers. And it's a re-implementation of CPython. Uh, it's open source, it's uh, MIT licensed, so you can use it forever, what, forever, uh, whatever you want to do with it. Uh, you can also contribute to it, which is also great. And um, they've implemented a large part of the standard library, so you do get this batteries included feel that we like about Python. And the best part about it is it has a REPL, or an interactive prompt. So now you can develop software in the way that most people who do software development with Python do it um, by you know, writing a little bit of code, trying it out, seeing why it breaks, and you know, modifying it as you go along. So I will show you. So this is the first part where it can go wrong, because it's a live demo. I'll show you um, how you can do that. So you open a terminal, and then you do the thing that every speaker, so if, if you're not nervous already when you're giving a talk, uh, a prime way to make yourself nervous is to have a camera pointing at your face, like on the big screen. But this little trick means you can actually see uh, the device. So this is what it looks like. And you can see it's plugged in with a, a black cable on black background. Um, and all, all, all this cable does is deliver power and transmit uh, characters. So my expensive laptop has become a dumb terminal. So you connect to it with uh, your favorite terminal emulator, I use screen, and when you connect, then, and you power cycle it, you're greeted with a bunch of garbage and then something which looks very familiar to people who use Python. And you can just start uh, doing maths, uh, you can print just as you would uh, in normal Python, if you're using Python 3. Um, you can also do maths like this, which to most of us is not particularly impressive, but if, you're, if you come from a microcontroller background, the fact that you can divide two integers and get a floating point number is something that is not, you know, is somewhat impressive. And you can also do big numbers, and you can do somewhat bigger numbers, and you can do very big numbers. So, you know, maths is easy on these things. And if you need to do more math, then you import the math module. And if you don't remember what's in the math module, then you type math dot, and then you press tab, and you get tab completion on your microcontroller. So if we do square root of 2 to the power of 10, that's 32. OK, so what's in an ESP8266? You saw a little picture of it before on, on the video. This is a still picture that doesn't wobble. Um, on the left-hand side, there's a plug where, as I said, you deliver power and a serial port. Then the actual microcontroller is the stuff underneath that gray cover. Uh, so everything around it is actually just there to support it. So it turns USB into an actual serial. Uh, it converts voltages, stuff like this. So there's also two LEDs built onto the board, which is very nice. You can use it. Uh, to write your actual first Hello World program on the microcontroller, but you can also use it to indicate uh, status and things like this. And then, as I said before, the squiggly thing has nothing to do with Python. Uh, this is the Wi-Fi aerial, and that really makes it a very nice piece of kit because you can suddenly do all sorts of things which are connected to the internet. And then, the big difference between microcontrollers and normal computers is that they have a whole bunch of these GPIO pins, and they're general purpose input output pins, 
And that's a complicated way of saying these are the pins to which you hook up your temperature sensors, your switches, your LEDs, your servo motors, whatever you want. Yeah? Via these pins is how you interact with the real world, and that's what most people use microcontrollers for. So a GPIO pin is a sophisticated three-way switch, and two of the states, the high and the low, is what you use if you want to control some peripheral. So you set it to high, which sends a logical high signal or one or three volts to whatever is connected, or you set it to low, which means zero, or you set it to the middle uh, setting, which is input, which is what you use if you want to sense uh, what is connected. So for example, if you can connect a thermistor, then you would use the input setting to sense the voltage, which would tell you what the uh, temperature is that you're sensing. And so the ESP8266 has a whole bunch of them, and you can control them from software. And so because the real hello world of microcontrollers is making LEDs blink, uh, I'll show you how to do that. So to talk to all these pins on the uh, board, you import a module called machine, and then machine dot pin, and now you need to know which pin you want to address. So I happen to know that one of the LEDs is connected to the second pin, but this is something you look up in the, in the documentation, and then you tell it that you would like to have this pin in the output mode because we want to control an LED. So you can see there's now a bright blue dot uh, on, on, the, on the chip here, so just over there. And if you want to change whether it's on or not, then you can set the, you know, basically you can set where the switch is. So now the LED is off, and if we do, oh, then it comes back on. And you can keep going back and forwards like this, and it changes the color of the, or the brightness of the LED. And that's kind of boring, so what you would want to really do is something like this. So actually, no, 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 no. We, we will automate it, yeah? My finger gets bored of going up and down. So we'll, we'll loop, and for that we need uh, the time module so we can do some sleep between switching the uh, pins, or the, the LED. So we sleep for half a second, and then we do this, and we sleep again. So you will see the LED comes on, and it goes off, and it goes on, and goes off. Ah, and this is what people do as their real hello world. Because it proves to you and everybody else that you can interact with the real world by the power of software. So, I promise to you I would explain why there's a bike here. Um, so, we were going to build a bike computer, right? So one thing we need to build a bike computer is some way to sense how often the wheel has gone around, because we'll use that to figure out how fast we're going. Uh, then we need a little bit of math as well to convert that uh, into an actual speed and distance. And then we need a display to somehow show the information. So for the switch, one thing that I found in the starter kit that I bought was a read switch which is a fancy name for the thing that most of us know from our home alarm system as what uh, keeps burglars out because it detects whether or not your door is open or shut. So these are two parts of, of this switch. One of them is a magnet and one of them is a switch which is uh, activated by the magnet. So with this we will get a, a switching signal every time the wheel goes around. Then. In my previous life, I was a physicist, so I did a little bit of math to work out uh, how, how to convert then the number of wheel revolutions 
and uh, the time between uh, wheel revolutions into uh, speed and distance. Uh, so you should trust me that this is correct. Um, <laughs> so distance is the number of times the wheel has turned times the circumference of the wheel, which for my road bike is 2.11 meters, as every road cyclist knows. Uh, for this bike, I think it's slightly different. Uh, and then once you know the distance uh, or the circumference of the wheel, then you just keep track of the delta T, so the time between switches, and that tells you how fast you're going, which if you're a scientist, meters per second is great. Um, if you're a normal human, you would probably want to have kilometers per hour or uh, miles per hour, so you can work that out as well. And then the only problem that I had was in my starter kit, there was no display. And then I had to think about it for a moment. What do I do? How do I show what uh, is going on? And in the end, it was obvious. I have a mobile phone in my pocket. All of us do. And it has a fantastic display. And the ESP8266 has Wi-Fi. So we'll just make a little web server on the microcontroller and then with our mobile phone, connect to it with a browser. And if you wanted to, you would call it uh, you know, internet of bikes or bike of networks or something like this. Huh? So, live demo, the next one. Oh. So, just to, to show you how things work, um, I'm not going to stand here and try and make a magnet go past the switch uh, very carefully. Instead, I put a button uh, on the board here. So I'll press that and pretend that every time the wheel goes round, uh, I'll, I'll click my finger. So to connect to the button, you need to look at where you wired it up to. And I uh, wired it up to pin 12. And then we want it to be an input pin. So uh, instead of before with the LED, we used a dot out. Now we do dot in. And then we also need a resistor, a resistor connected to this, which you can ask your local electronics friend to explain to you why you need this. Um, so now you can ask your switch for the value. And for whatever reason, when it's open, it gives you value 1. And if I push it, uh, so I promise I'm holding it now. Uh, now the value is one, uh, zero, and it remains zero, and let go, and it's back to one. So that's nice. We can now read out the switch. But really what we wanted to have is something which calls us when the switch is pressed. We don't really want to be having you know, a busy while loop here, which every few microseconds checks, has the switch been pressed or not, and then we end up missing it. So. The way you do that is you ask your dad about interrupt handlers. Um, or if you're old enough, older than me, then maybe you remember that interrupt handlers are a thing. So it turns out they're super easy to actually use in this project. The first thing you do is define a callback. So you make a function which gets called every time the interrupt handler is triggered. And before you do that, you need to have a variable in which we will keep track of how many times things get called. So if the button value is 0, then we would like to increase the value. Oh, no. Let's see if I can do this without making a typo. If the button value is zero, then probably the more often you try to type it without a typo, the higher the chances you will make a typo, right? Uh, so that's uh, right. And then we will also just print out uh, button. we will print out how often the button has been pressed. So now what you do, you install your interrupt handler, and you would like, we would like to be um, told when the switch goes from 1 to 0, so on the falling edge. And then we tell it that our handler is called pressed. So now, when I press the button, 
Hopefully, you will see a message. <laughs> okay. So, <clears throat> this was on purpose to explain to you one of the constraints of uh, interrupt handlers, obviously. Um, so interrupt handlers, think of them like threads which wake up as soon as uh, the hardware decides that the thread needs to run. This means that whatever is happening right now in your uh, program, it will be interrupted, your interrupt handler will run, and then it will resume running your code. This means if your interrupt handler is running while the interrupt handler fires, your interrupt handler will be interrupted by the interrupt handler. Uh, this means you cannot do things like allocate uh, memory and things like this. So what print apparently does is allocate some memory. And I promise you that this would be much easier to debug than uh, some Arduino thing which prints out, well, maybe nothing. So memory error is not particularly useful. But what we can do, so the problem, why does it not print out a nice traceback? Is because to do that, you need to allocate memory. <laughs> so what we do is we pre-allocate some memory for the traceback. And in the micro Python module, so I will, in the interest of time and typos, copy and paste this. So you can allocate uh, some buffer for uh, tracebacks. And then now if we press it, then you actually get a nice traceback, which tells you that you're trying to allocate memory in your interrupt handler, um, or whatever else you're trying to do which is not allowed. So to fix this, we'll make a slightly modified version of this. So again, if the value is zero, we increase n by one, and it turns out if you write your print statement like this, then no memory is allocated. So now, if I press the button, ah, yes, yes, exactly. So we need to install our um, new interrupt handler. So now, if I press the button, yeah, there we go. So. But you, as you saw, it's, it's confusing. And the first time you do this, you're like, what the heck is going on? But you get somewhat helpful error messages, and you can Google, you know, you get something that you can type into Google. So you will eventually learn that what you're doing is wrong and why it's wrong. So the last thing we need now is a web server that runs on the microcontroller. And that is not very complicated. So if you've done any socket programming in Python, then you will recognize the bit of code that I have here. If you've not done any socket programming, then you will not recognize it, but that has nothing to do with the fact that this is a microcontroller. However, it's more than five lines, so I will just copy and paste it, which gives me an excuse to show you one other cool feature of this REPL. So you can press Control E, and you're now in paste mode. So this now, because it's uh, a, a busy loop, will just sit there and do nothing. But luckily, I have a browser that we can go to. Am I connected to the right Wi-Fi? Yeah. OK. So if you forget what the network configuration for your, uh, oh yeah, no, I remember, yeah. So what you should do is you set up your live demo for the end of the talk, uh, and then you forget to switch the Wi-Fi network uh, for the first part of your live demo. So the MicroPython, or MicroPython sets up an access point for you and you can connect to it, so that's that one. And now hopefully, if I reload this page, oh yeah. 
and you turn on your web server. Oh my goodness. Okay, in the interest of time, I will just show you what I've been uh, waiting to do uh, all week, essentially. Not all week, all weekend, uh, which is the bike. Um, so I'll connect back to that uh, Wi-Fi. Okay, so we could set up the, um, the, the, the web server again on this guy, et cetera, et cetera. But really what I would like to show you is that if you hook up everything and you don't make any... And you stand behind the speaker, um, then you should be able to There we go. So this is uh, the MicroPython that is in the basket of this bike. So when I start moving it, hopefully it will change. I'm s sorry. <laughs> but uh, I've been wanting to cycle this bike uh, indoors in the conference center all weekend. There you go. That's all you need. <laughs> oh yeah, other cool feature I uh, added on the plane because you know nothing better to do than uh, modify your live demo on the way here is it detects when you stop cycling, so it resets itself. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, that's how you build a bike computer with nothing but a cheap door switch, a microcontroller, and a bit of Python. And so you can read that at your leisure. And if you want to ask any questions, then uh, go ahead, do that. Thank you very much. Um, how far away would you be, for example, from producing something using what you have there, actually to manufacture a bike computer that has an embedded web server that will connect to the phone in someone's pocket? Because uh, people are manufacturing these things for quite a lot of money, and it's obviously easier than it looks. So let, let me check if I have a picture from what it looked like the first time I attached it to my bike at home. Um, so it looked a little bit like this, which, um, you know, it's super cool if you ask me, but potentially <laughs> not ready, not ready quite for mass market production. Uh, I don't know. I think it should not be too much work, um, but working as a freelancer, I always say that, and it turns out actually it takes a long time. <laughs> so yeah, make a case, make a battery, and you're probably done. Uh, so this is super cool. Um, uh, have you uh, figured out how to do like the whole vibration dampening thing with, with el the electronics and biking. I know that's one issue that I run into when I've done similar things. So I've not run into that problem. So this seems to work quite well on, on Swiss tarmac, nicely paved. Um, yeah, the bigger problem is trying to hold the camera still while taking a video of your mobile phone. So that was the biggest problem I had. Um, <laughs> But it, it seemed to just work quite quite well. Yeah. Are there any tricks you can do to get like a deep sleep mode or basically power saving techniques, or is this just gonna burn through your battery like crazy? So at the moment it's just on all the time. Um, but the ESP 
itself can put itself into fairly deep sleep mode, and then you can connect. Um, you can use one of the pins to wake it up and then go back to sleep. If you wanted to do that every time the wheel goes round, I'm not sure how much power you would save, because I think it's something like two or three times per second at normal cycling speed, so. Um, do you need to install any external libraries? And also for this, for microcontrollers, are there many uh, open, are there many libraries that people are making right now uh, for MicroPython? For, for running on the microcontroller? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, GitHub is full of projects that people are doing, and most of them are open source, so you can just look at them. Thank you, Tim. Thank you.